sutta tonight is a Mahavidala Sutta, the greater series of questions and answers. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Venith and Pindika's Park. Then when it was evening, the Venerable Maha Kohita rose from meditation and went to the Venerable Sariputta and exchanged greetings with him. He actually came with his students because he wanted to ask Sariputta some questions so they could hear the answers Sariputta was going to give them. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Venerable Sariputta, <coughs> Excuse me. One who is unwise, one who is unwise, is said, friend, with reference to what was this said, one who is unwise. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it is said one who is unwise. What doesn't one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand this is suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it is said, one who is unwise. Now this is referring to the links of dependent origination and how the Four Noble Truths are in each link. Saying, good friend, the Venerable Maha Kohita delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Then he asked him a further question. One who is wise, one who is wise, good <coughs> friend, with reference to what was this said, one who is wise. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend, that's why it is said one who is wise. So anytime you hear the word wise or wisdom, it's actually referring to the links of dependent origination and how they work. What does one wisely understand? One wisely understands this is suffering. One wisely understands this is the origin of suffering. One wisely understands this is the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands this is a way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend, that's why it is said one who is wise. Consciousness, consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend, that's why consciousness is said. Now this is uh, the difference between recognize or recognize that has to do with memory. When you cognize that has to do with what you're seeing in the present as it's happening. And that is why consciousness <coughs> is said, friend. What does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. 
it cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend, that's why consciousness is said. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? Interesting question. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Listen closely for what one wisely understands that one cognizes. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it's impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. I love this question. What is the difference? You just got through told, being told it's impossible to separate these two things. Between, what is the difference between wisdom and consciousness? These states that are conjoined, not disjoined. Listen closely again. The difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Wisdom is to be developed. Consciousness is to be fully understood. Got it? You want to hear it again? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Wisdom <coughs> is to be developed. You have to develop the ability to recognize the links of dependent origination, right? It doesn't just automatically happen by itself. And consciousness is to be fully understood. Okay? So fully understanding means to see? It means to see and know. One of the things that I actually got in an argument with a, a monk about this because I, I use the word understand and he used the word see and I said they're the same but he argued about it. It's kind of hard to, to differentiate these two because seeing also has other meanings like you're seeing uh, color and form. But seeing is also the understanding. It's the, the deep internal knowledge. Okay. Feeling. Feeling is said, friend, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels. <laughs> it feels, friend. That's why feeling is said. What does it feel? It feels pleasure, it feels pain, it feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels, it feels, friend. That's why feeling is said. Perception. Perception is said, friend, with reference to what is perception said. It perceives. It perceives, friend. That's why perception is said. What does it perceive? Now, actually, uh, perception is the very beginning of conceptual thinking. Okay, you say, this is a table. Where's the table? 
Is it the legs? Is it the top? Is it the bracing? Where is the table? The table is made up of different things put together to make up this concept of a table. We only think in concepts. Now you see this and you say, what is this? It's a cup. Okay, that's a concept. Where's the cup? Where's the automobile? Where's the chair? Everything is a bunch of concepts. And that's one of the reasons why translation gets so tricky. Because you're always working with concepts and people have different ideas about some different words. It really does get tricky. <clears throat> So, what, what uh, we talk about in this sutta is colors as concepts. It perceives blue, it perceives white, it perceives red, it perceives yellow. It perceives, it perceives, friend. That's why perception is said. Feeling Perception and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one cognizes. So you recognize it. A feeling arises as pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. That's the perception of that feeling. And you cognize, you know it's there, right? So that's why the, the five aggregates are actually just three aggregates because three of the aggregates are always conjoined, they're always together. So that's a, a different way of thinking about the aggregates. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it's impossible to separate each of these states from the, from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Now we're going to start getting into a different kind of way of thinking about things. And this is called knowable by mind alone. Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? How many times do you hear me? You only have, you don't have a body. Five faculties, don't have them. You only have purified mind consciousness. Oh, but my back hurts, my bottom hurts. No, it doesn't. It is a mental pain. Okay? If you divide your attention and start paying attention to your body, you're not going to go very deep in your meditation and you're not going to understand how everything works. So you have to let go of the body. Friend, by purified mind consciousness, released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known thus. Space is infinite. 
the base of infinite consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. The base, base of nothingness can be known thus. There is nothing. Now the way that I'm teaching you is there's compassion with infinite space and there's joy with infinite consciousness and equanimity with the realm of nothingness. Friend, with what does one understand a state that can be known? You're going to love this answer. Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom. What does that mean? Seeing the links of dependent origination. Huh? Seeing the links of dependent origination. Well, there is that. Seeing and knowing without craving. <coughs> Absolutely. It's seeing and understanding both how something arises. Okay. Now in Kathmandu there's a very famous pagoda that has a pair of eyes and it has a squiggly line right here. I've always got a kick out of people because they tell me that squiggly line means the line of wisdom. Actually, you know what that squiggly line is? It's a hair. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, you, when you see the Buddha, he's got a little dot right there. It was a hair that was about two feet long and it was white. And it just curled up and it, it just stayed right there. That's what that is. It's not a third eye. It's a hair. <laughs> so, friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? That's an interesting question. The purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning, letting go of all of that stuff. And that's how you get into an unconditioned state. You have to let go of all conditioned things, and that means all the links of dependent origination you have to let go of. Now, I've always loved this part here. This is called right view. Friend, how many conditions are there for the arising of right view? Friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right view. The voice of another person and wise attention. We're talking about this other person being the Buddha. It's his voice we're talking about. <laughs> These are the two conditions for the arising of right view. See, if, we, if he hadn't come along, we never would have known anything about how the links of dependent origination work. And he, he sat down and figured it all out, which is really amazing. Friend, how many factors is right view assisted when it has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition? When it has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition? Friend, right view is assisted by five factors. 
when it has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition, when it has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Here, friend, right view is assisted by virtue, keeping your precepts, learning, discussion, serenity, and insight. Hmm. Right view is assisted by these five factors and ha has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition. It has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Virtue, learning, discussion, serenity and insight. The learning, at first you learn a lot about the precepts and all of that sort of thing, but it's also how you're teaching yourself how this process works. And you're teaching yourself how to let go of craving, how to recognize craving, how to let go of the craving so you don't get caught. And the discussion, you really have to be kind of careful with discussion. Um, one of the things that has started to happen in some of the countries that I've been teaching at is there's a, starting to be more and more people that have had attained Nibbana and they try to hold discussions with people that do different kinds of practice. And it just turns into arguments. And you have to be careful who you're talking with. Okay, if you want to be able to talk with somebody that you can actually communicate with, not get in an argument with. So what I wind up telling most people is don't talk to anybody about your attainment. That doesn't, that's just, that's your personal information. Nobody else needs to know what attainment you have. But you can talk with them about Dhamma. And because you have these attainments, you're going to understand more deeply. So you can actually start helping more people. So, now this is a section on being, and this is what I call habitual tendency, but it's only taking one part of habitual tendency. It's only taking the sense sphere realm. Uh, in Pali, this is called bhava. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it existence, he calls it becoming sometimes, which is kind of okay, but kind of not. Because it doesn't really explain, especially when you're getting into dependent origination, when you use the word habitual tendency, you understand what you're, what's happening there. That's why I had that major discussion with the Venerable Usil Ananda. And I basically asked him if it was okay that I started using that, and he said yes. And then I'd get around other monks and I would hear them talking about, um, about bhava and in my mind, I kept on replacing it with habitual tendency, and it works. So, I prefer to use that because it's, it's less confusing. But it doesn't touch 
all of the different kinds of bhava. It's just the sense sphere bhava. There are these three kinds of being, friend. Sense sphere being, fine material being, that means getting into the first jhana to the fourth jhana, and immaterial being, and that means from the fourth fourth uh, or the four states after the fourth jhana. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future generated? Friend, renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on a part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So craving and hindrance, these are, these are big major ones. So you have to be able to recognize these as clearly as you can and let them be, let them go. I got it. I, I seem to get in an argument with a lot of monks. But I got in an argument with a, a monk that uh, I said uh, the root word of ignorance is to ignore. And he didn't like that at all. And he said, no, the ignorance is talking about the, the Four Noble Truths and not understanding the Four Noble Truths. I said, oh, you mean ignoring the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> Gave me one of those. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, too many people, they use the definition of ignorance as stupid. And it's not it. It's not understanding. It's not understanding different concepts, different ideas. So when you, when you start looking at ignoring how the Four Noble Truths work, that is true ignorance. And um, it's easier for people to understand in, when you describe it in that way rather than just ignorance. You know, call me ignorant? I'm not, I'm not ignorant. I know a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, but we're talking specifics. And the craving, which is getting, it's becoming better understood, but it's only taken me 20 years to have people start understanding more about craving. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future not generated? Friend, with the fading away of ignorance, with the arising of true knowledge, with the cessation of craving, Renewal of being in the future is not generated. Yeah, I'm gonna... Just so you get more a clear idea about dependent origination and how the Buddha did this, how he figured it out. This is called the origination. Monks, 
before my awakening, while I was still only a bodhisattva, not yet fully awakened, it occurred to me, alas, this world has fallen into trouble in that it is born, ages and dies, it passes away and is reborn. Yet it does not understand the escape from this suffering, headed by aging and death. When now will, will an escape be discerned from this suffering, headed by aging and death? Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. Aging and death have birth as its condition. Then it occurred to me, when what exists does birth come to be? By what is birth conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is habitual tendency, birth comes to be. Birth has habitual tendency as condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does habitual tendency come to be? By what is habitual tendency conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is clinging, habitual tendency comes to be. Habitual tendency has clinging as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does clinging come to be? By what is clinging conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is craving, clinging comes to be. Clinging has craving as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does craving come to be? By what is craving conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is feeling, craving comes to be. Craving has feeling as condition. Now, understand, he was one of the most advanced meditators in the world of one-pointed concentration. He was really smart. And he learned how to do those meditations because of so much past meditation that he had done in, in lifetimes before. But this is brand new concepts and he was he, he was uh, figuring out, and, and now you get more and more an idea of what a truly brilliant mind he had. Because he would, he would go and he would, well, just come up with craving, okay? Now, what, what happens before craving arises? And his mind was, settled enough that he would look in all different directions to see the, the easiest thing to understand. Oh, feeling. Yeah. Feeling happens and then that, that craving arises. So he was, 
what can you say? <laughs> I mean, he was really a smart guy first for asking those kind of questions. Because he was really concerned that people were suffering a lot and they didn't have any way to get out of it. I meant to teach people. And then, so advanced. Well, but after he figured it out. But the thing is, when you start reading about the Buddha and his night of enlightenment and all of this kind of stuff, it didn't tell you that he'd already figured out the links of dependent origination, but that was intellectually. Okay? When he saw and understood how these links actually did arise and how they pass away, that's when he became awakened. So he figured that out? So he, figured, he figured it out intellectually first and then by direct knowledge. No, yes. Really. How, how can he figure that out intellectually without having seen it? Do you hear what I was just reading? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's how he figured it out. Because he said, first had it intellectually set it out and then... Well, saw the, it he's then. figuring it out right now. Okay. Then all of these, it. all of it. And, and then he has to see it as it actually occurs. But how? How can he know that before seeing it? It's amazing. Well, listen again. There took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. That's how he did it. It was a breakthrough. It was revolutionary. Nobody would ever thought to look this way. That's the kind of mind he had. It's like a scientist, right? Having a Very much and then putting it to the test to see if it's right or wrong. Yeah, very much. Mm. I think uh, making that sort of jump from you know, what's the condition for death being birth, no. on some level it's blindingly obvious. <laughs> but, but, I mean, just, you wouldn't think it in a million years, would you? No, that's really true. Yeah. It's funny, because I've always found it feels better to go from death and suffering first and you would sort of learn them back, go back like that, it kind of goes in easier just as you're explaining it now. If you go the other way, I find it a bit more choppy, yeah. but coming back from death and that way is yeah, smoother. And that's the way you actually learn it, that's the way you're teaching it yourself. When a hindrance comes up, okay, and you, you six are, and then it comes up again, you start to notice right before you got pulled away by the hindrance, there's something there right before that. So the next time you catch it right there and now you're, you're not caught for as long and you start seeing how this process works. Would you say if you catch it right precisely there that that's catching at the habitual tendency? Well, it can be any one of the, the uh, links of dependent origination. It depends on how long you've been doing it and where you're catching it and how long you've been staying with your hindrances before you noticed yeah. it. And, but it pretty much follows this pattern. Mm -hmm. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does feeling come to be? By what is feeling conditioned? That's another one. Why would you, how can you figure that out? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is contact, feeling comes to be. Feeling has contact as its condition. <coughs> then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists,
does contact come to be? By what is contact conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me through a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are the six sense doors, contact comes to be. Now, this is the one thing that is a little bit iffy for me. Six sense doors, I mean, that's six different things. And he had to figure out, well, he knows what the sense doors are, but he had to be able to put them all together and put them and, and show that. When you go to the Diganikaya, that's the long discourses, uh, I think it's Sutta 15? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ananda, when he, when he first became a monk, had become a Sotapanna. And then he uh, got busy doing, helping other people and doing things, and then he became the attendant for the Buddha. And he didn't have a whole lot of time to do meditation, and he never got the fruition of uh, Sotapanna. Anyway, he went someplace with the Buddha and he sat in meditation and he got the fruition and he came to the Buddha and he said, you know, this dependent origination, I don't know why so many people think it's so difficult. This is easy as easy can be to see it. And the Buddha scolded him and he said, it's not easy. It took me a long time to figure this stuff. <laughs> <coughs> but when they talked about how he saw the links of dependent origination, he didn't see ignorance, he didn't see formations, and he didn't see the six sense doors in the description. Well, ignorance, it's pretty easy why he didn't see that, because he was seeing that in each one of the links. The formations is the potential, the preparations for body, speech, and mind, so he's not going to actually see that. And the six sense doors, he's not going to see all the six sense doors, he's, he's going to see Nama Rupa. He's going to see mentality and materiality. So it's, it's real interesting how he only saw nine links of dependent origination, but if the, you, there's places in here that you can go and you can see 23 links of dependent origination. And Anyway, uh, quite often when people are seeing the links of dependent origination after they've had the experience of Nibbana, when they start seeing the links, at first you just see uh, one, one set of the links forward and back, so that's 24 links. But when you become a Sakitagami and your mindfulness is good, it's twice as long. And then you become an Anagami, you're starting to see more and more clearly the links of dependent origination, but you'll see them three times in a row. So you really do start to see them more clearly. And you'll start to see them in in everything, in everybody around you. You 
start recognizing the impersonal nature of everyone. And you'll start seeing things more and more clearly as process and impersonal process. So, when you become an, an arahat, you see it four times. And uh, you can spend a lot of time going over that. It, it's quite interesting to do that sort of thing, I'm told. Okay, contact comes to, uh, when there are the six sense bases, contact comes to be. Contact has the six sense bases as condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, do the six senses come to be? By what are the six sense bases conditioned? Then, monk, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is mentality and materiality, the six bases come to be. The six sense bases have mentality, materiality as condition. So, <coughs> the actual experience is, I mean, you, you talk about the twelve links of dependent origination, but the actual experience is uh, from almost everybody that I talk with about this sort of thing, it is nine, unless they just want to add in one or, one or two of the other things. That, but it, it is very interesting, and uh, Sister came on, on uh, she's putting up a website on Damasuka, Asia, and she has a uh, uh, a little thing that shows you how to make a chart of all the links of dependent origination and how you understand the links of dependent origination. It's quite good. So if you want to look that up. I think she's got it up by now, I don't know for sure. And it's also on YouTube. It's, and it's on the YouTube, yeah. So, okay. One of the things that happened in Malaysia was there was a group of eight Chinese that didn't speak English. And she still taught them the links of dependent origination, and they understood it because of the translator she had. And that was that was really inspiring to see that they actually did understand the links. Then, monks, it occurred to me when what exists does mentality and materiality come to be. By what is mentality, materiality conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is consciousness, mentality, materiality comes to be. Mentality, materiality has consciousness as conditioned. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does consciousness come to be? By what is consciousness conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are preparations, consciousness comes to be. Consciousness has preparations as condition. Then, monk, it occurred to me when what exists do preparations come to be? By what are preparations conditioned? 
Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is ignorance, preparations come to be. Preparations have ignorance as condition. Thus, with ignorance as condition, preparations come to be. With preparations as condition, consciousness comes to be. Origination, origination. Thus, monk, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true wisdom, and radiance. And then it goes through the, the, the cessation. I'm not going to do that. But that gives you an idea. I think I get a bit lost with the two links of preparations and consciousness. The kind of jump from consciousness to the next link. Formations. <coughs> preparations. <coughs> the potential for body, speech, and mind. That's what that is. Mm, okay. Okay? saying it doesn't sort of click <laughs> like the other ones do but the rest of it I can see things following on like a flow you but to call this, this is it's it's the potential for these things to arise that's why it gets kind of cloudy okay. you have to have them so they arise mm. but this is from past uh, karmic that's why they arise at all. But I feel that uh, Sankara also translated that as defilements. Is it? Sankara is... is defilement. Defilement? No. No, no it's formations. Okay, so now we'll go back to the sutta that I was reading. Now we're going to go to uh, jhana. Friend, what is the first jhana? Here, friend, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. This is called the first jhana. Friend, how many factors does the first jhana have? Friend, the first jhana has five factors. Here, when a monk has entered upon the first jhana, there occur thinking, examining thought, joy, happiness, and unification of mind. That is how the first jhana has five factors. Friend, how many factors are abandoned? in the first jhana, and how many factors are possessed? Friend, in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned, and five factors are possessed. <clears throat> Here, when a monk has entered upon the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned, ill will is abandoned, Sloth and torpor are abandoned. Restlessness and anxiety are abandoned. Doubt is abandoned. Now, th these are the five hindrances, aren't they? So when you get into the first jhana and your mindfulness is good, your mind is very pure at that time and you can actually attain Nibbana at that time if your mind is ready. Okay? So, 
this is why the Buddha was so, uh, he spent so much time talking about the jhanas and explaining the jhanas and the importance of the jhanas. Now in, in the Anguttara Nikaya, he called those that attain jhana, jhanagami. We just learned about this not that long ago because we, David uh, was the one that he, he got a hold of the Anguttara Nikaya before I did and read, read about it. In book number four, I think it was section 124? Yeah, 123 to 125. Yeah. yeah, right around there. He talks about Janagami, and he said, if you practice the way that he teaches so that you don't have any craving while you're in that jhana, when you die, you're going to be reborn in a Brahma Loka for a period of time, depending what Brahma Loka you're in. And from there, you are going to attain arahatship and get off the wheel of sansara. So everybody here is going to, unless you've taken a bodhisattva vow, you're going to be reborn in a Brahma Loka and then you're going to get off the wheel of sansara. <laughs> Every one of them. So there's nothing to be done. <laughs> Some you is faster than others. <laughs> But it also says that if you don't practice the, the meditation in the way that he teaches, that means absorption concentration, one-pointed concentration, because you are not letting go of the craving, you're suppressing the craving with the concentration. You'll be reborn in a Brahma Loka the next lifetime. But when the merit of being in that realm expires, you're going to be reborn in a hell realm. I thought reborn in the human realm, sir, but hell, hell realm. Wow. That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. Hunter, how about the, the people who take the bodhisattva uh, vows? They just doesn't <laughs> talk about that. I don't know how to how to. don't know how to justify it, because uh, bodhisattvas have a long, long, long time that they have to purify, they, they have millions and millions of lifetimes that they have to work purifying their, their mind. And there's, there's, they call them the ten parami. Well, there's three degrees of the ten parami, so there's actually thirty parami that they have to work on. And it takes a long time, millions and millions of lifetimes. And according to the Theravadans, the only people that really attain Buddhahood they have to, uh, one, they have to have the potential to become an arahat within seven days and renounce that. They have to have uh, the willingness to give up their life for Dhamma. 
because they do that many, many, many times. They have to have determination that is really, really strong. And they, the whole time that they're bodhisattvas, they're honest. They don't tell any little white lies. They don't tell any kind of fabrication. Now, what's happening now is there's, there's always been a big push by the Vajrayana and Mahayana, both to take a bodhisattva vow. And what do they say about the bodhisattva? Oh, I give up attaining Nibbana until all beings can attain Nibbana. Well, the Buddha couldn't do it. If he could, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> so is that a realistic kind of vow to take? What I, I have been around some um, some students that were very good at remembering past lifetimes, and they ran across bodhisattvas every now and then, and they were talking to me about uh, this one, uh, she was a Burmese lady, she was actually kind of famous. She, she was working with uh, Pau Ox Idol. And she said that what happens to most people that take a bodhisattva vow is they start figuring out how really hard it is and how many lifetimes they have to go through it and they don't have strong enough determination to become a future Buddha. So they renounce the vow. And then when they renounce the vow, they're not reborn necessarily in a Buddha era. And they get caught up in Sansara. So my thinking is, let go of a bodhisattva vow and attain Nibbana now. <laughs> that, mean, that makes sense to my mind. To go through the millions of suffering lifetimes that you, sometimes they really went through a lot of painful stuff. And I haven't got the determination to do it, so I figure a lot of people are like me, so. <laughs> and, it, it's, and it's your choice. I, I don't uh, try to make up anybody's mind about it. But I do try to give out the information about a bodhisattva vow. Because if you take a bodhisattva vow, it will stop you from attaining Nibbana right now. You'll get right up to the edge of it, but you'll never, never cross over. And I, I have a couple of friends that are bodhisattvas, and they, they know and they understand it. So, okay, that's your choice. Whatever you're going to do with it, that's fine. I had one student that I was a couple of years ago in, in Malaysia. He and his son became uh, Samanera. I ordained them as Samanera just for a short period of time, for two weeks. And they would eat at the same table with me and they were always talking about the Bodhisattva vow. I've taken the Bodhisattva vow. I really like the Bodhisattva vow. What do you think of the Bodhisattva vow? So I gave him an honest answer. And the father said, I really, I want to attain Nibbana. And I said, okay, give up the Bodhisattva vow and you will. <coughs> But I like being a bodhisattva. I like the idea of being a bodhisattva. Okay, then don't. 
It's up to you. I'm not going to make up your mind for you. It's a personal choice. So finally, he said, what do I have to do? So I told him. And he gave up the bodhisattva vow. And his meditation right after that went extremely deep. And two days later, he attained Nibbana. And then he was really happy that he gave up his vow. <laughs> but again, that, that's just a personal choice. You can do it if you want or not, but understand what is the chances of becoming a future Buddha are really, really hard and really, really difficult. Now, when you think about a <coughs> Uh, Mahakapa. Okay, that's the, that's called a world cycle. And what that is is the expansion and contraction of the universe. Now the numbers I'm not positive on because Burmese and numbers are not they're not real accurate sometimes. But I have read in a commentary, there are four asankayas, four parts of a mahakapa. One asankaya in earth years equals in years, 10 with 160 zeros behind it. Okay, that's a long time in itself. <laughs> Now, what happens is, for one asankaya, there's the expansion of the universe. Now, with the expansion of the universe, that's where beings live in that universe. But it'll go for one asankaya, and then it will stop for one asankaya. And then the universe will contract for one asankaya, and then it will stop for one asankaya. So, four asankaya equal one mahakapa, which is ten with five hundred and sixty zeros behind it. That's a real long time. Now, there are basically three kinds of Buddha. They're all Buddhas, but the length of time that they, it took them to become a Buddha is different and their lifespan is different. Gotama was considered an intelligent Buddha. It only took him four mahakapas <laughs> and a hundred thousand lifetimes to become a Buddha. Now he lived where the lifespan was not very long. During the time of the Buddha, the average life lifespan was right around 120 years. So it was he wasn't around all that long, and that's why he had he gave he was always giving dhamma talks. Always it took huge amounts of energy to give dhamma talks as much as he did. And uh, the next kind of Buddha is called the energetic Buddha. Now, it takes, uh, that Buddha, it takes eight Mahakapas and a hundred thousand lifetimes. And their lifespan is around 10,000 years. <laughs> they only give a Dhamma talk oh, once every 10 years or so. So it, it's a lot different. Then there is the other kind of Buddha, and it's called the moral Buddha. And 
it takes 16 Mahakapas in the 100,000 lifetimes. And uh, their lifespan is something like 100,000 years, and they only give a Dhamma talk like once every 100 years or so. They just don't give many Dhamma talks at all. But because they're, they're in a period where people are more moral, they, they live for a longer period of time, that still seems like it's a lot of, uh, a lot of Dhamma talks coming at them that may get a chance to digest it. So, it's kind of an interesting thing that uh, Gotama was considered very intelligent and it only took him four Mahakapas to become a Buddha. But because he was only around for a short period of time, he had to really put out a lot of energy, he had to put out <coughs> a lot of effort giving all kinds of Dhamma talks. So, becoming a future Buddha uh, is really a difficult, difficult task. And a lot of people that take bodhisattva vows wind up renouncing the vows because <coughs> after 50 or 100,000 lifetimes and you, you look and you're still only a beginner and you start going, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> this <is really> tough. <laughs> How do you know if you've taken one of these vows? Uh, you will have when, when you're young, um, around between 13 and 16 years old, you'll have a very, very vivid dream of entering a Buddha's body. And you will know that as soon as you do that, you will know I am a Bodhisattva. That's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> If you enter in the foot, that means you're just a beginner. If you enter in the navel, that means you're, you're getting there, but you're still a long ways from the goal. You enter through the heart, you're getting closer, but you still got to couple Mahakapas to go. <laughs> you enter through the forehead, then you're getting close to becoming a, a, a Buddha. And you might only have oh, a few more million lifetimes to go through. Yeah. So I read there are 17 known Buddhas before Gautama for the Amen. No, there, there are different, that, different lengths of time. Some Buddha eras, they only have one Buddha in that era. The Buddha era that, that we're in right now, the, there's going to be one more Buddha after Gotama, and there are six Buddhas in this era. So this really, we're really lucky to be this close to that many Buddhas. But it's a huge, huge number of years. You mean one Mahakapa? No, no, no. We're, we're talking really long periods of time. Okay. Uh, when you go to the Shwedagon Pagoda, the Burmese have, uh, at the Shwedagon, they have four different Buddhas. And they're, they're showing the four different Buddhas that were in this era. And one of them is Ka 
gossip. Uh, one of them is uh, Ray Watt. Uh, uh, one of them is Mado. I can't think of the fourth one. Deepankar? It might be Deepankar. I, I, I don't remember. I was, I was just kind of quickly introduced to all of them and it was like the Burmese, they wanted to, yeah, I want to show you this. Here, see? Okay, let's go over there. <laughs> <laughs> Maitreya is coming. Yeah. And the story with uh, the Burmese is right after the Buddha came, became enlightened. He was he spent about seven weeks and different trees in different areas in that and, and then he decided that it was time to go find uh, somebody to teach and there were some merchants that were coming through and they saw him and they wanted to offer him food because they found out he was the Buddha and he hadn't been fed and they wanted to be the first ones to do that. But they were they were just gonna put his food in a regular bowl and the devas didn't like that idea. So they got four bowls from the deva loka that were made out of crystal and they put them together and they gave the Buddha the bowl so that they, he could have that to eat out of. So he always ate out of a crystal bowl, which I thought was kind of neat. And they they gave him his food and in honoring them, he pulled out seven hairs and gave it to them. And then they went off on their merry way and he went off on another direction and the story is those merchants were Burmese and they took it to Rangoon and they gave the hair to, uh, I don't remember her name, but it was a queen. And she built a small pagoda that was only about 12 or 14 feet tall and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's 312 or something like that. But when I was in Burma, they were, they put up the scaffolding and they were re-gold leafing the entire pagoda. And I got to go all the way up to the top and see the umbrella. <laughs> They have an emerald, a green emerald that's that big, that is the clearest, brightest color. Uh, it is just magnificent. And they have rubies that are like that, that are really, really deep red. And rubies are almost as hard as diamonds, and they carve Buddha images out of ruby, and I haven't figured out how they've done that yet. It's really amazing. But the the umbrella was big enough. It was yeah, it was about the size of this room, only it was round. And I, I got to go up and hang out there for a little while and sit and do some meditation. And, <laughs> Did you see the sick hands? Where where were the sick hands? In the emerald or where? No, they're inside. They, there's a, a a vault inside the pagoda. So I've been blessed. <laughs> And then I went to Sri Lanka and I went to the tooth relic and I saw the tooth. 
they don't ever let that out, but I happen to be with, with a, a very famous uh, Sri Lankan monk, and we were there for a conference. And he took me in and he said, he opened up the thing and said, this is the Buddha's tooth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I, I've been pretty lucky. <laughs> That's what happens when you practice your generosity a lot. You get those kind of wonderful <coughs> things. So, anyway. <laughs> My talk has gone straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Ah, a friend. There are these five faculties. Each have a separate field and a separate domain and do not experience each, of, each other's field and domain. That is the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, the body faculty. Now, each of these five faculties, they each have a separate field, so you don't smoke, you don't uh, see through your nose, right? They're, they're separate fields and separate domains. And they don't experience each other's field and domain. What is their resort? what experiences their fields and domains. Friend, these five faculties each have a separate field and a separate domain and do not experience each other's field and domain. That is, the eye faculty, ear faculty, nose faculty, tongue faculty, and body faculty. Now these five faculties, each having a separate field and a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain, have mind as their resort, and mind experiences their fields and domains. Friend, as to these five faculties, that is the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body faculty. What do these five faculties stand in dependence on? Friend, as to these five faculties, that is the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body faculty, these five faculties stand in dependence on vitality. Friend, what does vitality stand in dependence on? Vitality stands in dependence on heat. Friend, what does heat stand in dependence on? You're going to love this answer. Heat stands in dependence on vitality. <laughs> Ah, just now, friend, we understood the Venerable Sariputta to have said vitality stands in dependence on heat, and now we understand him to say heat stands in dependence on vitality. How should the meaning of this statement be regarded? That's a decent question, I think. In that case, friend, I shall give you a simile, for some wise men here understand the meaning of the statement by means of a simile. Just as when an oil lamp is burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on its flame, and its flame is seen in dependence on its radiance. Got it? Can't have one without the other. How's that? 
<coughs> that help? We have a flame that naturally has radiance coming off of that flame. And if there's no flame, there's no radiance. But if there's no radiance, how can there be a flame? Okay, friend, are vital formations things that can be felt or are vital formations one thing and things that can be felt another? Vital formations, friend, are not things that can be felt. You'll understand this. Ah, isn't that better? I'll get that in a minute. If vital formations were things that can be felt, then a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness would not be seen to emerge from it. Because vital formations are one thing and things that can be felt are another. A monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness can be seen to emerge from it. Okay. We'll get more in just a second here. Friend, when this body is bereaved of how many states, is it then discarded, forsaken, left lying senseless like a log? Friend, when this body is bereaved of three states, vitality, heat, and consciousness, it is then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log. Friend, what is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness? Friend, in the case of one who is dead, who has completed his time, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided. His verbal formations have ceased and subsided. His mental formations have ceased and subsided. His vitality is exhausted. His heat has been dissipated and his faculties are fully broken up. In the case of a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided. His verbal formations have ceased and subsided. His mental formations have ceased and subsided, but his vitality is not exhausted. His heat has not been dissipated, and his faculties become exceptionally clear. In other words, you've seen the pictures of saints and that sort of thing that have a halo around them. Guess what? It's real. People's face become extremely beautiful and radiant. And a lot of you are starting to have radiant faces too. Your face becomes lighter. Your face becomes radiant as your mind becomes more and more pure. I used to tell my students that, you know, if I could bottle this, I could be a millionaire. <laughs> no time at all. But your faces become, uh, the, the 
women especially, the faces become younger looking. And, and the, the lines in your face just start disappearing. Why the women, not the men? It happens with men, but it's, it's easier to recognize with women. I don't know why. But it happens with men too. Sometimes I'll look at somebody and it's like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I remember you when you first came in, but you're not the same person now. <clears throat> it's really pretty amazing. And sometimes it's like your face has become so radiant we don't need light in a room. Your faces <laughs> are enough to light everything up. Okay. This is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And this is what I was talking about before, when I, you can get into that state, then you need to actually put a little piece of paper there saying, leave me alone, I'm fine. <laughs> because you're not going to feel a heartbeat. You're not going to see them breathe. But their body will stay warm. So you have to leave them alone. Don't take them to the hospital and have a, do an operation on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to talk about deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind? Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, that's equanimity, where it's very nice and strong which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. These are the four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind? The signless deliverance of mind is a cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. No sign arises. Friend, there are two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs. and attention to the signless element. Now, I have some real problems with that because you don't have consciousness, so how do you have attention to a signless deliverance of mind? It, it doesn't make sense. I, I haven't figured this one out yet. These are the two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are three conditions for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs, attention to the signless element, and the prior determination of its duration. So when you can get into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, before you get in, you make a determination how long you're going to stay there. What, I, what I've found is it takes some practice to be able to sit for long periods of time in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. You can sit for up to seven days. But most people don't have that much time and they, they don't want to do that. 
so that's up to them. But you make a determination when you're going to come out. Okay, you, you let's say it, it's a real useful tool, especially if you're real busy and you get tired. You can make a determination to be in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness for 30 minutes and you feel yourself go in and then when you come out it feels like it's one or two minutes later and it's 30 minutes later and you feel like you've had eight hours of sleep. You have a lot of energy. So there's real advantages to doing that. Some, some of my students in Indonesia, they say, yeah, I can do that, but why? I have so much other stuff I want to do. <laughs> well, there's an awful lot of relief in not having any disturbance for a period of time. Uh, one, of, one of my students, he, he sat for a long period of time, more than two days. And I asked him when he came out, how long did it feel like he was in, in there? He said, oh, it felt like about 10 minutes. And it was two days later. That's how much relief he got from that. And he actually doesn't get much sleep. He sleeps two hours, sometimes every other day, sometimes every day. But he, he keeps pretty busy doing things. So it's kind of interesting. But you do have to make a determination. If you don't make a determination and you sit in the cessation for longer than seven days, your body's going to die and you're going to go to another realm. Friend, how many conditions are there for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are two conditions for the emergence of the signless deliverance of mind. Attention to all signs and non-attention to the signless element. What happens when you get out of that, you feel, that you don't want to be bothered right away. <coughs> you come out and you're very much relaxed and you're, all your sense doors are very much alive and, but you, you just want to sit and feel comfortable but eventually you get up and start moving around but you, you feel more you want to be secluded more you want to be have more time just to be at ease Okay, friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, that is the Brahma Viharas that I've been teaching you. The deliverance of mind through nothingness. The deliverance of mind through voidness. The signless deliverance of mind. Are these states different in meaning and different in name? Or are they one in meaning and different in name only? Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through voidness, the deliverance of mind, uh, the signless deliverance of mind, there is a way in which these states are different in meaning, in meaning and different in name. And there is a way in which they are one in meaning and different in name only. What, friend, is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name? Here a monk abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second quarter, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. 
So above, below, around, and everywhere. Does that sound familiar? Something like the six directions? Hmm. Guess where I got that? And to all as to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving-kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion and goes through the whole thing again. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with joy. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity. Likewise the second, third, and fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere. And to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is called the immeasurable deliverance of mind. And what, friend, is a deliverance of mind through nothing? Here, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing. This is where you get into the equanimity that I'm showing you. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is called the deliverance of mind through nothing. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through voidness? Here, a monk gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut reflects thus. This is void of a self or of what belongs to a self. This is called the deliverance of mind through voidness. Right after I became a monk, I went into the forest and I, I spent about six months watching my mind a lot, trying to figure out where thoughts came from, or if it was my thought or not. Is this me? Is this mine? Where did that come from? And I did it for about six months. You get really, really quiet and your mind becomes very much more used to seeing the impersonal nature of everything. You, you stop having so much excitement of mind. Things don't get you so uh, excited. You just, you're seeing the impersonal nature of everything. It's an interesting practice, but it, it's also a difficult practice because how many times does your mind pop up with something? Did, was that me? Did I? Or is that the person standing next to me? Am I picking up their thought? Where did that come from? And letting it be, letting it go. You can go quite deep in, in your practice when you do that. It's, it's an interesting practice. Okay, and what, friend, is the signless deliverance of mind? Here, the non-attention to all signs. A monk enters upon and abides in the signless collectedness of mind. This is called the signless deliverance of mind. This is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And what, friend, is a way in which these states are one in meaning and different in name? Lust is a maker of measurement. Hate is a maker of measurement. 
Delusion is a maker of measurement. And a monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. So what are we talking about here? Letting go of? Uh, good. Of all the kinds of immeasurable deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust void of hate and void of delusion. No more craving. Lust is a something. Hate is a something. Delusion is a something. A monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of deliverance of mind, through nothingness, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. Lust is a maker of signs. Hate is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. A monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising of all the kinds of signless deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. This is the way in which these states are one in meaning and different in name only. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The Maha, Kohita, and his students were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. So, we have four questions. <laughs> All that information that you gave us about Buddhas and periods of time and all that kind of stuff, where does that come from? Uh, some of it is from the Samyukta Nikaya, some of it's from the Anguttara Nikaya, some of it's from the Digha Nikaya, some of it is from uh, the sub-commentary of the Dhammapada, <coughs> Some of it is from the Vinaya. Some of it is from the uh, commentaries of the Jataka tales. Okay, that tells me where it's recorded. That tells you where it's from. Well, some that, well that's where I got the information. Okay. All right. And there's also a book called the Buddha and his teaching by Narada. It's really it's it's one of the first Dhamma books I ever wrote, I ever read. It's great. It's it's about this thick, and it's it's a green book, <coughs> and it tells about all of the different relatives of the Buddha. And it has fascinating stories, but it always has, <coughs> has uh, footnotes where you can see where he got the information from in what, what book and what sutta. And it's, it's really, it's a, a good book. 
But did the Buddha teach this? Did it come from... Well, yeah. Where else would we get this? That, that was my question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it is commentary and it is sub-commentary, so there's some stuff that's added in a little bit and sometimes taken out a little bit. Thank you. There's... I, I can What's the name of that that one book that we just got not too long ago about the history of these different uh, uh, Buddhist councils? Do you remember? But I can link you to a it's a called a Buddhist course on Urban Dhamma the net or something. It's a huge PDF with all this information. Everything that you just said in about 20 times more. It's really good too. It's put together by a Burmese monk. Yeah. Just can I come back to the basic drawings? <laughs> the habitual formation is for me almost like a reflex that we make it, we need it to make it more efficient to interact with the external environment. I um, don't really agree with that. Your habitual tendency is what you're talking about. That's where the emotions are. That's where a, a lot of the stuff gets uh, the sadness, the anger, the, all, of, all of these different kinds of, of emotions that we take personally. I see. So that's what it means. So, so when, when you are using the six R's, that won't come up so much. And your, your mind will naturally start to develop more and more equanimity. So you don't have these emotional upsets. You don't have anger and anxiety and fear and depression and whatever the catch of the day is. It always feels to me like a trigger, that one you were yeah, talking about. It's it like is a trigger. Like, it is like a trigger. When you do the six hours, it's like you take your finger off of it <coughs> and it just doesn't fire. Because yeah. It feels like that. That's the reason that you need to keep practicing the six hours. 